what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Tony Horton, Baby Einstein, founder Julie Clark, um, Atari founder, and many, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today's episode, I'm gonna, this is gonna be a little bit different episode actually today. Um, I had an amazing entrepreneur, and he actually invited me to interview him uh, for his podcast, and it was so good. I said, can you, please let me release this on mine. Today's episode is brought to you by um, Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. At Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect their Dream 100 clients and referral partners, and we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. Um, you know, as people have listened, if you've listened to this before, podcasting is much more personal to me and it was inspired by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were concentration camps in Nazi Germany and were the only members to survive. But his legacy lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him, which you can watch on my about page. So yes, podcasting will help your business. It's been the best thing for my business and my life in general, but it helps you and your guests leave a legacy. So if you have questions, um, I believe you know any business should have a podcast. So if you have questions, you can email us support at rise25media.com or learn more, go to rise25.com. John and I made a video and we even left in the outtakes. So now check out today's episode. Ian White here. Welcome to the Daily Profit show. These are certainly unusual times with everything going on with the coronavirus and the global spread of this pandemic and concerns about the impact on the global economy and the stock markets. I'm pleased to be here with you today to share some of my ideas in terms of how you can navigate this crisis and profit on the other side. With me today, I have Jeremy Weiss. Jeremy has done thousands of interviews with successful entrepreneurs investors and CEOs and today we flip the script and Jeremy is going to be interviewing me and leading our discussion about the coronavirus what it means for the economy and ultimately what it means for your portfolio so Jeremy thanks for being on the show with me today yeah and thank you thanks for having me and um, you know this is gonna go far and wide so I want to introduce you um, if you don't know Ian and the work at Wyatt Investment Research they've been doing it for the last almost 20 years and he's been helping regular investors uncover hidden growth opportunities um, and he's been actively investing for the last 30 years and they share their lessons and um, I think you know I was telling Ian we need to talk about this because I consider him one of the leaders in this field um, and they have over 300,000 people that rely on the Wyatt Investment Research and the Daily Profit for their market insights and investment ideas, especially in these crazy, turbulent times. So if you haven't checked out the Daily Profit um, and all the episodes, go to dailyprofit.com, sign up for Ian's free e-letter to get access to the top investment ideas and favorite growth sectors. Um, so we have a lot to talk about. Um, I mean, I guess where I want to start, Ian, is you're bunkered up. Talk about the state of affairs with you, your family, and then we can go into the, the broader um, economy and what people should actually do. Yeah. So, uh, Jeremy, thanks again for being here. You know, I'm working from home today. It is, uh, it's Monday and I'm working from home. We pulled our kids from school last week. So the schools are shutting down here in Vermont midweek my wife and I decided we wanted to be a little bit proactive so we actually pulled them out on Friday and so they're at home being homeschooled I have four little kids so that they're they're being homeschooled we're going for walks in the woods I was uh, you know you know I was reading I think it was your email that said uh they're shutting down gatherings of 50 or more and you're like well school but schools are still on yeah 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 I saw this last night on um CN, CNN um, and, the, and the headline was, you know, CDC recommends no gatherings of more than 50 people except for schools or businesses. And I, I thought, you know, how is it that, you know, gatherings of 50 people in a bar or a club or a movie theater are bad, but if they're at school or working, um, it's perfectly safe. It seemed a little bit crazy to me. So, you know, my kids are homeschooled right now. We've essentially shut down our office. All of my team members at Wyatt Research are working remotely. 
and you know we're uh, sort of uh, laying low but continuing business as usual and so you know after this podcast I get to be the PE teacher for uh, for my four kids we're gonna go outside and play uh, play a little scrimmage game of soccer in the yard so it, these are certainly interesting times and you know I, I believe that uh, you know this is a once in a century type of event I actually started journaling about my experience uh, here with my kids because I think uh, my kids and grandkids will someday uh, perhaps appreciate uh, a few insights from what life was like during the great pandemic of 2020. So before we get into the economy, how are you navigating the kids stuff now that you have all the kids who are home and, yeah, you know, and educating them? Yeah, you know, my, my wife, uh, my wife, spent most of the weekend putting together an educational plan for them for the week. So that's underway and she's leading that. And I'm trying to be holed up in the office here. Um, and hopefully we won't hear any kids in the background or dogs barking. Uh, but if we do, I hope you'll excuse us. So, you know, th things are good here on the home front. And, uh, you know, I think it really is important that younger, healthier people uh, like us uh, do our part to avoid the community transmission of coronavirus and avoid contributing to the impact for other people because it's not people like me and you who are going to be affected by this. It's folks who are older and at risk demographics. And, you know, I think it's a small part that we can play and responsibility that we have, we have as, as a society. So I was reading your email this morning, um, attention, president Trump closed down America. Do you want to just talk about that for a second? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, you know, the, the situation here in the United States is becoming more and more dire, you know, by the, uh, by the day. And, you know, when you look at the numbers um, in terms of coronavirus cases here in the United States, the numbers are surging. The number doubled um, between Friday and today. So uh, we are certainly ramping up. I think that the official number is right around 3,800 cases here in the United States as of the recording of this podcast and you know it's march 16th i guess monday march 16th so 3800 um and you know i saw in an interview with a doctor from and leading leading uh, health professional from johns hopkins who says he thinks right now today in america there's somewhere between 25,000 and a half a million cases of covid 19 we just haven't tested enough and you know when you look at what other countries where they've been successful in containing this. There are two examples. The first is China, and the second is South Korea. The two countries each took a different route to try to stop this. In China, they essentially, you know, instituted martial law, shut down the entire economy, would not let people leave their houses for four to six weeks, um, and essentially they've, they've crushed it. Um, coronavirus, uh, there are cases there, but it's not spreading and things are under control. South Korea took a different approach. They haven't gone into lockdown like they've done in China and like they're doing right now in Italy, Spain, and France. And instead, what the South Koreans decided to do was aggressively test for COVID-19. And so, you know, in, uh, in South Korea, uh, the numbers are um, are just crazy. I'm trying to pull them up right here, but I think they've tested over 200,000 people in South Korea for this so that they can identify who has coronavirus, they can isolate them and keep them away from other people. Um, and so when we think about where they are, they're aggressively testing, but let's put this in context. As of last week, South Korea had tested about 200,000 people. The United States had tested 2,000 people, okay? We're a much bigger country. so. We're behind, um, we're behind on both the testing, which hasn't happened, and we're behind on the containment, which also hasn't happened. So uh, in my letter to President Trump, I recommended that the U.S. step it up on both fronts, that you know, we need to ramp up the testing. There have been promises of millions of tests being made available. There were supposed to be 4 million tests available last week. I guarantee you that didn't happen. Um, we're just not testing enough. And, you know, I think this is getting, this is much worse than most people believe right now. And if you want to see signs that the American people are starting to panic, just try to go to a Costco or go to your grocery store and try to buy bread or toilet paper. You'll be hard pressed to uh, secure either of those items. So, you know, I think the situation is bad. And, you know, my recommendation is that the U.S. really should move into a full lockdown 
today. We should do it now. We shouldn't wait. Um, we know if we look at the cases in uh, Italy, France, Spain, the writing's on the wall. <clears throat> the U.S. is going to have to shut down the economy. And what that means is no interstate travel, no airlines, every bar, restaurant, hair salon, every service business, 100% closed. Um, and I think that's where things are moving very quickly. I, I was supposed to have a routine doctor's appointment this afternoon um, at, at the hospital. You know, the doctor's office is at the hospital. I'm supposed to go in. I got a call from them this morning saying, um, do you have a health emergency? If not, don't come to the hospital. We don't want you to come in. Stay at home. Um, things are changing very, very rapidly. Um, and we've never seen anything like this before. Yeah. So what do you think is going to be the impact on, and we could talk about specifically stocks and other things later, but on the economy and what the government's going to have to do, because, you know, as you know, like small businesses or businesses may only have 60 days of cash flow, 30 days, two weeks for payroll. Yeah. And same thing with, with people in general, they may, people are living paycheck to paycheck if they are getting laid off or they're not being able to work um, because of this, um, what do you think the repercussions are going to be or what do you think, you know, the government is going to have to, to do? Yeah, you know, I think um, to answer the first part of that question, you know, I think the United States is heading towards a recession um, without a doubt. The first quarter GDP numbers will show, uh, you know, slower growth than last year. Uh, but I expect in the second quarter and third quarters of this year, you're going to have negative GDP growth. And, you know, that's, that's certainly going to reflect the decrease in activity. Um, you know, how deep it'll be, I think, is really a determination of, you know, how long do things grind to a halt here in the United States? Um, is it two weeks? Is it a month? Is it two months? Um, how long? And how bad does this get? And it's really hard to model that, but I would expect that we're going to see negative GDP growth. I think the small businesses are going to be the most hard hit with this because as you said, you know, if you're running a bakery or a restaurant or a hair salon, um, you don't have huge cash reserves. You don't have a ton of uh, money on the balance sheet. You don't have deep pocketed investors and um, it's going to be tough. And, you know, the government, uh, certainly wants to help. I, I think both Democrats and Republicans want to help the small business owner. I just wonder if they're going to be able to react fast enough because it, you know, I don't see how the federal government is going to be able to help small businesses cover their payroll in two or four weeks. Totally. Uh, and yeah. so people are going to be filing for unemployment. I know here in Vermont and other states are already starting to change the unemployment, uh, you know, uh, sort of regulations to make it easier for people to get unemployment. Um, but I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be big, uh, really big. I think the U S government is going to do their best with the small businesses. I think, you know, after what we saw in 2008, 2009, I think the federal government will do uh, what it needs to save, you know, the larger companies, airlines, cruise lines. I think the government's going to bail out anybody who needs it in terms of big companies uh, the Fed's already stepped up, uh, you know, lowering interest rates and, you know, buying up over $700 billion of treasuries and, uh, and you know, mortgage-backed securities. But, you know, this isn't, this isn't a Fed, this isn't a monetary, this is a medical issue. This is a, this is a health crisis. And lower interest rates don't solve the fact that people are scared to leave their houses um, unwilling to travel, events are being canceled, and things are you know grinding to a halt. The, the Federal Reserve can't fix that. Um, what fixes that is addressing the uh, the underlying issue, which is a health crisis. And I think that you know whether you're a Democrat or Republican, it really doesn't matter. I think the the leadership that we've seen out of Washington has uh, fallen short of expectations. And that's why the market's doing so poorly. And, you know, the fact that the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates and coming into the market and buying up securities, every time they've done that, the market crashes, okay? Um, you know, the market moves lower. And it's because people are saying, holy moly, if interest rates are being cut and if the Fed is doing this, things must be worse than we expected, okay? They're worse than we expected, so holy moly, you know? So that it's certainly not helping matters. 
So for people who don't, um, haven't been following what's going on with the interest rates, take just a minute and tell people and, and how you think that will affect things. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think interest, lower interest rates certainly will help things, um, you know, and it certainly help if you want to refinance your home or borrow money. But, you know, again, that's not what's going to solve uh, things here in the economy um, in the near term. I think that investors are rightfully worried that um, the market is weak. You know, and I, I'm, you know, right now, you know, the S&P 500 is trading around uh, 20, uh, 2,500 or so. Um, as we record this, um, you know, I believe that we could see the market move lower by another 20% from this level. I think we could mm-hmm. see a range of 2000 to 2100 on the S and P 500 by the time it bottoms out probably within a couple of weeks. And, you know, the basis for that projection is, you know, I think corporate earnings are going to take a big hit. Um, and we'll see, you know, earnings for the index of around $145, um, versus, you know, the price right now of 2500 um, So, you know, my projection uh, is based on a 14 to 15 price to earnings multiple on the index, which is a historic norm. Um, and again, this could go lower depending on how earnings come in and, you know, how, how much appetite investors have to own, own stocks uh, during this downturn. So, you know, I think right now, um, you know, I would be selling into market strength, um, not being a not bargain buying right now you know the market's falling like a knife you don't want to try to catch a falling knife okay but it <laughs> let it hit the floor and bounce off um which brings me to an interesting anecdote um i was talking last friday with a friend of mine who's a financial advisor and um we were talking and he shared with me that for one of his clients uh told him he wanted to protect his portfolio and so you know instead of selling his stocks and realizing capital gains and getting a big tax bill, he decided he'd simply short sell the S and P 500 index, right? The SPY, which is, you know, the biggest ETF in the world. And so he, he short sold, he was trying to short sell the S and P 500, um, but he couldn't do it. And the reason is that if you want to short sell a stock, right, which is a bet that the stock price is going to go down, you actually have to borrow it from someone else. You have to borrow the shares from someone else in your brokerage account, and then you sell them into the market, and then you buy them back later, ideally at a lower price. But what that tells me is, and again, this is he's a he's a financial advisor at one of the biggest independent firms in the United States. Okay, this isn't a small firm. He couldn't find the shares. There were no shares available, which means 100% of the S&P 500 was short sold on Thursday. Okay, which means there are huge bets against the market. And so when we saw Friday's trading activity, this is what happened on Friday. You'll remember. The market was up two or three percent for most of the day, and then the last hour of trading, it, the market surged to be up about nine percent by the close. And you know, my theory on this is that essentially all of the short sellers who'd made a killing last week and the week before decided that going into the weekend, it wasn't worth it to have the trade on. You know, because if the market conti- if news improved, you know, Federal Reserve does something, if the government, Congress does something. Stocks could continue moving higher. They didn't want to have the risk going through the weekend. So they covered all their shorts, which is why the stock market roared higher at the end of the day Friday. But you know what? It's Monday morning and the market's back to normal and the stocks are down another 9%. So all those gains that we got on Friday are now gone. Again, we're back to where we were. So my point is just that, you know, I think the market's going to be really volatile and we're going to see some real aberrations like this. Um, you know, typical trading, you might see a 1% or 2% move in a, in a day for the S&P 500, that'd be a big day. 1% move for the S&P 500 is a huge day, okay? But we're seeing lots of days with 3%, 5%. 5% 5% has become the norm. 10% is like, ooh, holy moly, that's a big move. Um, so volatility is way, way up. And, um, you know, it reminds me of the saying that, you know, the stock market takes the stairs up, but it takes the elevator down. And that's certainly true. Um, you know, we're giving up uh, years of gains in a few short days. So these are certainly challenging times for investors and certainly test yeah. the patience of investors um, who are in the market for the long term. So I want to talk, uh, you know, about what, what should people do? And I wonder if we should group them into different categories of maybe there's someone right now who's literally ready to retire, retire and all their money is tied up and just hit a, you know, huge decrease and then maybe there's someone who's 
um, you know, at a certain age range where, you know, they're maybe looking at more longer term things in the market, um, however you want to break it up. But um, what should, you know, in these like volatile times, what should people do? And maybe in different, different segments that we're looking at. Yeah, you know, I think that for, um, for people who are younger, you know, you're, you're, let's say you're in your 40s, um, you, you still have, you know, 25 years of working or more, um, you're going to be just fine. Um, the coronavirus is going to come, it's going to go, and, you know, life will return to normal and stock prices will too. You know, this is a temporary setback on a road, you know, on your path towards, you know, building wealth over the long term. Uh, for folks who are well, let's let's stick on that for a second. So, forty. Is there anything they should do? Should they just not do anything? Should they be buying things, selling things? What should they be doing right now? Uh, yeah. Um, should, so they don't freak out like they maybe are. Yeah, you know, I think that I think that in the near term, there's going to be more downside than upside. I think the market continues to have asymmetrical risk. There's greater opportunity for downside loss than there is upside potential. If more losses are going to give you financial concern, make it so that you can't sleep at night and you're worried, um, then you know I would I would suggest uh, folks could take money off the table by moving money from stocks into uh, fixed income or cash. Now you know again everybody's situation is different, right? And everybody's risk tolerance is different. And I'm not a financial advisor, and I can't give any personalized investment advice uh, for folks. Um, under any circumstance, especially if I have no idea what their situation is. But, you know, I think that, you know, for people running a balanced portfolio, meaning a split between stocks and bonds, you know, bonds um, provide some ballast during times of uncertainty. And so, you know, what I would look to do in that situation would be to sell uh, bonds once we get closer to a bottom and start buying stocks and increase my exposure to the equity markets. So, um, you know, folks could look at doing that. And, you know, personally, you know, I've, I've taken money off the table um, in my taxable investment accounts. And I've also moved to cash in my retirement account. Okay, I did both those moves uh, a couple weeks ago, um, started getting really defensive, feeling like the market was on very shaky ground. You know, there are no tax consequences of doing so in a, in a 401k or, you know, any type of retirement account. Obviously, if you have capital gains in your equity account, uh, you're going to pay a tax bill um, if you're, you know, selling winners uh, to raise cash. So, you know, the decision is a little bit harder with a taxable account. But, you know, I think that we're going to see the, the market bottom here um, probably sooner rather than later. And we know that when it does, there will be, you know, once in a decade opportunities for investors to buy investments that are trading at a deep, deep discount. The, the key thing is to make sure that you have the cash available. Um, and the willingness uh, and the appetite to step up when things seem uncertain. You know, the, you got to remember that the market will lead the economy. Okay, so the stock market isn't basing its price today based on the news today. The stock market's anticipating where coronavirus ends up. Um, it's probably factoring in the fact that uh, you know millions of Americans will get this. Um, Hundreds of thousands will die, and the U.S. economy will take a big hit on in a recession. Oil prices are also anticipating the same thing. You look at oil prices. Um, you know, I was reading data um, that showed you know in the first two months of the year, uh, 2.5 million barrels less of demand for oil globally than last year. Two and a half million barrels a day. Okay, oil went plunging from you know what. $45 to under 30. No, uh, more than that. It, it, you know, it, it's, you know, under $30 a barrel. So oil is getting crushed. Um, Saudi Arabia, you know, and so on top of all this coronavirus stuff, we have oil price getting crushed and Russia and Saudi Arabia deciding to get into an oil war where Saudi Arabia is essentially trying to put Russia out of business and put the U S fracking companies out of business. So we could do a whole nother show about, how the recession and this bust in the oil price could spark a whole debt crisis in the United States that's akin to what we saw in 2008, 2009. It's just instead of, uh, instead of individuals and homeowners, it's going to be corporations that have loaded up on debt for the last 10 years. So we could do a separate show on that and dig into that at greater length because I think that you're going to see a huge, huge downgrade in the debt markets of 
a lot of big companies like Verizon and General Electric, um, you know, tons of companies seeing their debt downgraded. And, uh, you know, that could be sort of the next wave down of this, uh, of this bear market. So for someone in their 40s who's, you know, every situation is different, you're saying to not try and catch a falling knife situation? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't step up and be buying socks right now. Um, you know, I think that, I think that what we want to do is as an investor, I want to see things, I, I want to see a little bit more pain, um, in the market. You know, I haven't seen enough, um, uh, capitulation on the part of investors, you know, just throwing their hands up and saying, I quit. Um, typically that's when the market bottoms is when you're, um, seeing a, and you know, you'll notice it's just talking with friends. They'll say, I'm out of the market. You know, I got out of the market. I'm 100% in cash. I'm, in, you know, I'm, I'm buying gold. Um, you know, or just sort of giving up. You know, have you checked your stocks? No, I'm not even looking at the account. Okay. When that, when that happens, when you see people saying, "I'm not even," when you, when you hang out with someone, although, although nobody's having dinner parties, nobody's hanging out with friends these days. But when you hear people saying things like, "You know, I'm, I've just given up. Um, I'm not checking my account statements. I'm not logging into my account." That shows capitulation, which is when things will bottom. I think we're a little ways away. I think the I think the news flow on this is going to get worse and quite a bit worse um, in the coming days. And I think, you know, I think most Americans aren't yet, um, I don't know, this is changing very rapidly. As of last week, most Americans didn't think this was going to be that bad. Today, folks are waking up to the fact that this is going to be real bad. And they're starting to realize that this is going to dramatically change their way of life. Um, for the coming weeks. And we're not used to that. Oh, yeah. We're not used to the government saying you can't go to a restaurant. You got to stay home. You can't get your hair cut. You know, we're not used to it. And yeah. that's where we're headed. It's you know? unprecedented. You know, we've never experienced something like this. I have a friend in another state who their uh, one of the teachers was uh, tested positive Corona. So they quarantined all, I mean, this was before they shut down the schools. Now they've shut down all the schools, but this is before they did quarantine every single child, you know, sent them home. And then also because the parents were exposed, quarantine the whole family, yeah. you know, so literally can't go out if they wanted to. Yeah. I mean, we haven't seen something like this since, uh, the Spanish influenza in 1918. So we, it's been over a hundred years. Um, we probably won't see anything like this again in our lifetimes, uh, thankfully. But um, you know, you know, it really is unprecedented. Now, you know, so so we've been sharing a lot of doom and gloom. Um, so you know, I guess the, there can be a little bit of uh, good news here, and the good news is that um, once the United States has this contained, things will start to improve um, with the financial markets, and so you know, one of the things that I was looking at was what's happened in China. And what we see is that um, the Chinese stock market dipped dramatically uh, during the phase when, you know, the number of cases in China were skyrocketing. And when this was clearly out of control, um, we saw, you know, you know, the, the stock market was crashing. And as soon as China got this contained, uh, meaning no community spread. The numbers, instead of going up by thousands a day, were going up by five or 10 cases a day. Um, what happened was the stock market rebounded within a matter of days uh, and went right back to where it was uh, before the market crashed, but essentially almost all the way to new all-time highs. And you know, since then, the, the Shanghai index has sold off again, along with all, everybody else, because it's clear that this isn't just a Chinese, China story. This is a global story. So, you know, the, the market sold back off a little bit. But w what I think that that shows is that, you know, investors in the market will view this as a black swan event, a once, a once in a century event. And, you know, the market's going to be volatile and fall in the near term. But once this gets under control, um, the markets should come back to where they were before. And, um, you know, I, I think, with, you know, relative, uh, you know, speed too. So, you know, I'm not su suggesting there's going to be a, you know, a V-shaped recovery, meaning it crash all the way down and then soar back up in 10 trading sessions or anything like that. I think it will be more like a U-shaped uh, decline. So it's going to take a little bit of time. But, you know, I, I think that we'll, the markets will be trading decidedly higher than these levels 
12 months from now, um, I think will be, you know, high, much higher than these levels. And again, investors who have cash um, will be well positioned to take advantage of the situation. So right now, um, you know, no one can determine, I guess, the exact time that people, let's say someone has an abundance of cash and they want to you know, capitalize on this opportunity. What segments, I know you've been doing a lot of research on, you know, different segments or things that people should look at that are going to, that they should look at, I guess, investing in or. Yeah. You know, I think, um, a couple ideas, you know, we've been doing a lot of research into the biotech space, um, and biotechnology stocks. We've seen some of these stocks, you know, going up 20, 30, 40%. Um, these are small, small and mid cap companies that are working on coronavirus uh, vaccines. So there's been a lot of excitement there. Biotech sector as a whole has held up better than the overall market. There certainly are some uh, bright spots and companies there that we're looking at. So biotech is one area that I think is uh, very interesting right now. And, you know, the, the market for a vaccine is going to be absolutely huge. So, you know, I think that's, that's one area of excitement. Another area uh, that I think uh, will do well is gold. You know, we have gold trading uh, near, you know, what, six, seven year highs at this level. Um, again, it's sold off a little bit in the last week, but, you know, people have sold everything, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything sold off in the last week um, because there's been, you know, a race to find liquidity. And, you know, when people are looking to raise cash, they sell anything they can get rid of. So, you know, I think that we've seen, you know, a lot of uptick in interest in gold. I think gold mining stocks are particularly interesting. Uh, the sector has been bruised and beaten up for, last decade really and you know it's probably it's gold is probably overdue to, to outperform anyways but in times when the government is printing money which is what's happening right now and uh there's fear fear is uh you know is everywhere people look for safety and security and let me tell you something when people are looking for safety and security they don't go and buy ethereum or bitcoin okay <laughs> They want to buy gold, okay, or they want to hold U.S. dollars, or they want to hold U.S. treasuries, even though the ten-year will pay you under one percent. So, you know, I think that you know, if you think about the places where you can make money in a in during a, a prolonged period of uncertainty, um, cash is king, uh, bonds are rallying, and um, you know, gold is the number one safe haven in the entire world. So, you know, I think that gold and gold socks are, are a place that, you know, most, most, most people are under allocated, you know, they, they either own no gold or maybe a token, you know, uh, they have a couple thousand dollars in a gold ETF like GLD. Um, it, you know, historically though, people would have five, 10% of their portfolio in gold or gold socks. So, you know, I think that that's a trade that, we'll see people moving into. And, you know, one other thing related to gold is that, you know, gold is, uh, it, you know, it takes a lot of energy to run mining operations and oil prices just got knocked down, uh, cut in half. So, you know, the cost of operating a gold company also just uh, fell dramatically. So we think there's some opportunities there. There's two other categories, you know, last time we talked, <clears throat> Ian is, um, e-commerce and we were talking about Amazon stock and this was um, um, I think we were talking in November or even before then of what would happen with Amazon stock um, and and actually before this whole coronavirus thing hit um, you what you had what your research had shown was exactly on point you know so if people had bought it when we had talked they would have uh, it, it rose exactly to the point um, where, where you said it was from the research, where do you see things like Amazon or other e-commerce companies going now, um, that people are basically staying home and they're homebound? Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, companies like Amazon, uh, can continue to thrive, um, in this environment. I think more and more people are, uh, buying things online. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I ordered, uh, some soccer balls for my kids for our, you know, afternoon gym classes. So I, I ordered four, you know, we have one soccer ball now, but I was like, I need to get four if we're doing gym at home. So I bought four new ones. And, um, you know, Amazon prime here is normally two day delivery. It's four days. Okay. Amazon saying we're not going to deliver it in two days. We can't. Um, so they're just getting flooded with orders. They can't keep up. Okay. 
Um, but one of the things to remember is that we're simply probably shifting uh, behavior, right? So, you know, people are going to the grocery store and they're loading up, they're, they're filling the cart now and filling the pantry, filling the freezer, but they're not going to buy later because they're going to use that stuff. They're just, they're just buying it up front. And so I think the same thing is probably happening in e-commerce and mm. um, we're probably seeing a shift, which means we'll have better results uh, in the first quarter of the year and worse results in the second quarter. So, you know, but if you look at stocks that have held up well, you know, uh, stocks like, um, you know, like Costco uh, have been doing phenomenally well. You know, two weeks ago, my wife and I went to Costco. This was two weeks ago to stock up our pantry and freezer, um, knowing that this was coming. And um, at the time, I, I asked the, the people at Costco, I said, How, I said, how's business been? They said, it's been crazy, been nuts for the last week. I spoke with my parents who tried to go last week. They said they pulled in, they got, they walked into the store. The line was from the front of the store to the back of the store. And so they left, they didn't even go in. They were like, yeah, forget about this. We'll do something else. So, you know, companies like Costco, I think are going to have a great quarter. The stock is holding up um, remarkably well. Um, I mean, Costco is down, you know, at what, 5% from, uh, from all time highs. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, I think some companies are going to survive uh, and, and do quite well. Others, you know, Costco may, is probably seeing a shift. Um, you know, I, I sort of wonder, though, with, with companies like Amazon, um, if the federal government closes things down, locks things down, um, will Amazon be shut down? Um, is Amazon going to deliver? Is Amazon going to take your orders? And is UPS or are UPS and FedEx, are they going to keep delivering packages? I don't know. I mean, a week ago, I would have told you, yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, we, we know that in places like Italy, Spain, and, um, and France, you know, grocery stores and pharmacies are remaining open during these, you know, essential government lockdowns. You know, in, in China, uh, it was much more strict. But again, you know, the Chinese government has an iron fist. They'll do whatever they want. I, I don't know if the same, you know, locking people in their houses um, under military threat um, is going to fly here in the United States. You know, I guess we'll see, but uh, these are certainly uncertain times. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, obviously some, some companies are going to thrive. I think, you know, in terms of a portfolio, you know, I would look for companies that um, can deliver their services or products or take orders online. I look for companies that have a lot of cash um, on their balance sheets. Companies like War uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway should be uniquely positioned for this. Warren Buffett has about 60% of his entire portfolio in cash. They are ready to invest. They're open for business. And Warren Buffett says, you know, Berkshire Hathaway will be a lender and uh, investor of last resort for companies that need capital. And, uh, you know, Berkshire Hathaway was there in 2008, 2009, when nobody else had the cash or the conviction or willingness to write a check. Warren Buffett did, um, you know, and really helped, helped a lot of American companies uh, weather that storm. And I know is personally, I'm a Berkshire Hathaway shareholder. Uh, and, you know, I think Berkshire is uniquely positioned uh, to weather this storm. This is, this is when Warren Buffett does, does the best. Um, and this is when Berkshire thrives. So um, as a Berkshire shareholder, you know, um, I'm, I'm expecting that we'll see some pretty decent gains here in the, in the coming couple of years. Has he put out his advice in this situation? Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, Warren Buffett, um, you know, he, he, he'll always tell you, you know, stocks for the long term, America is great and the economy will come back. And, you know, he's right. You know, if you look at over periods of, you know, 10, 20 years, um, America has been uh, a unique uh, experiment with capitalism and, you know, the invest, investors here have done incredibly well over the long term. That's going to continue. Uh, after coronavirus and after we've all forgotten about this and thought, wow, that whole COVID-19 thing, wasn't that really weird for like a few months when we were locked in our houses and we couldn't go to work? Um, and we're going to be like, wow, that's so odd. Um, and Warren Buffett's right. You know, I think the, the challenge is that, you know, even if you understand that, you know, there's a lot of pain in the near term. So, you know, Warren Buffett will always, always tell you he's bullish on America. Stocks are going higher. The market's going to be good for you. Just be a long-term investor. And he's right. But if you really want to know um, what Buffett thinks about the market, what he thinks about stock prices, what you have to do is you have to look at what he's doing. Okay, you have to look at his behavior. Now, you know, when at the end of last year, Berkshire Hathaway has, you know, something like 60% of its entire investment portfolio in cash. Okay, not bonds, cash, US dollars. 
what that tells you is uh, Buffett thought stocks were overvalued um, and he was waiting for an opportunity to buy stocks at the right price. And this is what Berkshire Hathaway has been waiting for. Um, I would expect that we'll see uh, some big deals uh, with Buffett uh, come out of this. We know that Berkshire Hathaway uh, likes the airline industry and has been long airlines. We know that he likes the big banks and the financial sector. So I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, Berkshire Hathaway step up uh, in the airline business with the financial sector, perhaps even cruise lines. Eventually people will forget about this and start going on cruise uh, cruises again. So um, things will go back to business as usual. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but, you know, I think Berkshire Hathaway will, will be a winner coming out of this. So, Ian, what about for, you know, again, we the scenario of bad timing. Someone is getting ready to retire and they just took a huge hit on their nest egg. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that, um, you know, if you're just retired or getting ready to retire and you've just taken a big hit on your nest egg, well, you know, hopefully someone in that situation wasn't hundred percent invested in stocks um, because that would have been an irresponsible way to structure a portfolio if you were getting ready to retire. So let's hope that they were, you know, uh, at least 60% stocks, 40% bonds. So the bonds are providing some, uh, some cushion here for the blow to equities. Um, you know, at that point, you know, you haven't really realized the loss until you sell. So, you know, selling now, I think would be a, a big mistake. You know, we were warning our clients early in this process, um, as early as February 27th, that we saw a lot of pain on the horizon and that stock prices were moving lower, not higher, and brace for impact. Um, and so, you know, folks who got out on February 27th probably accepted a 15% decline, which, you know, nobody likes that, but it's a lot better than 30% or, you know, I don't know where we are right now, 30% down from the highs. So they've been able to protect themselves a bit. And, um, but you know, I, I think if, if you haven't sold anything and you're retired or thinking about retiring in the near future, I think, uh, ride this out, uh, you know, selling into this right now, I think would, it would be a mistake. And at this point, you know, it's, it's really hard to predict where the market's going in the short term. It's a coin flip. I don't know if stocks are going higher tomorrow or lower. I don't know exactly where the market's going in the near term. I think market, the market will move lower before it bottoms out. But again, you know, if I'm wrong and stocks, you know, bounce back and this is the low, um, you probably, you know, if you cash out now, when are you going to jump back in? Are you going to jump back in after they go up 20%? I don't know. Um, so, you know, I think, I think sort of saying the course is key and, you know, one other final piece of advice for someone in that situation is just because you're retired doesn't mean that you need hundred percent of the capital. You know, it's not like you retire and then you say, okay, give me all the cash in my 401k. I need it all tomorrow. You know, that's not how it works. You know, you're most, most people draw out a small percentage of their retirement, uh, savings, uh, you know, throughout the duration of their retirement. And so while your balance may be showing, um, a lower number now than it was two or four weeks ago. Um, you know, I think you got to remember um, if you're 65 years old and your life expectancy is 85, you've got another 20 years uh, to make that money work. You have 20 years during which the market is going to continue to rise and, you know, stay the course. Don't, don't let this derail you in the near term. And, um, and I, I think have confidence that, you know, America has been through a lot and the, and the world has been through a lot world wars, revolutions, oil shocks, um, you know, numerous crises, the great, great recession, the great depression, um, you know, and we've come out on the other side, you know, stronger and, um, and better able to deal with what the future is going to bring us. So, you know, I think, uh, I think now, you know, I think it is important to keep uh, that frame of reference. This is not the only crisis the market's faced. It's not the only crisis the economy has faced. Uh, we have the smartest people working on testing and working on vaccines and a solution to this. This too will pass and it's going to be painful in the near term, but, uh, you know, six months, a year from now, I think things are going to be looking decidedly different and investors who move a hundred percent to the sidelines, um, stop following the market stock, stop being involved are going to suffer. Um, this is exactly what happened after 2008, 2009. You know, the people who lost the most were those who sold at the low points. They sold out at the low points 
and then they didn't return to the markets until 2015, 2016. They waited five, six, eight years, 10 years to return to the market and start buying again, missing out on all the gains. So I think that's, that, that's a bigger mistake to me is if you go 100% up to the sidelines, when do you get back in? And are you going to miss out? So, you know, I want to point people towards dailyprofit.com. Check out uh, other episodes, also wyattresearch.com for your, you know, they can subscribe and get your uh, free uh, e-newsletter. Any, any other final words that we should talk about with the economy, um, coronavirus, or anything else? No, you know, I, I think we've covered a lot of ground related to the recession and where we are with the market and where we think stocks are going in the near term versus in the long term. And, you know, for most people listening, um, you're a long term investor, you're not a short term investor. So let's focus on the long term. Um, and, you know, stay the course, don't let this throw off your plan. And, you know, I want you to be comfortable, want you to get through this and know that, you know, we're going to face some challenges and negative headlines in the near term. But in the long term, you know, America has uh, the greatest economy in the world. We have the most innovative companies in the world. We have uh, some of the hardest working people in the world and some of the best education systems in the world. And we're going to get through this, too. So uh, stay positive, even though uh, we're all locked up at home uh, trying to weather the storm. I'll ask you in three days when you're locked up with four kids how positive your nose <laughs> 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 Thanks, Ian. I appreciate it. Being here. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.